Welcome to Cheers. I'm your host, Avery Woods. Hi guys, welcome back to the Cheers Podcast. I'm your host, Avery Woods. Today we are just chilling. I got my comfy sweats on, no makeup. Also, it's allergy season, so that's why I sound like I have tampons up my nose or something. So if you hear me sniffling, that is why. Today we are doing another saucy episode. I asked on my Instagram what you guys wanted to see and everyone, like 90% of the submissions said they wanted a saucy episode. So... I did a little Q&A box and we're just going to go through them. We don't hold back here on the Cheers podcast. And if you sit and watch this whole video just to hate me, it's okay. You're still giving me views. (laughs) I feel like the saucy topics are so controversial, but I just, I really don't get that. I, I feel like it's uncomfortable for a lot of creators to talk about stuff like this. So I feel like I'm the big sister to a lot of people, which I really like and enjoy. I just don't get embarrassed easily. So I feel like I wish I had someone to get advice from or listen to these things from in the past. And so might as well just take it on myself and speak openly and it makes me happy and I'm happy to be here with you guys. So one of the first questions Actually, I just found this line at Target and it reminded me of this. She said, hi, Avery. What's a tip for cleaning the downstairs with a kitty emoji? I just found this line at Target and it's called down there wash and then down there wipes. So I'm assuming the brand is called down there, but I honestly don't know the brand, but it was like in the tampon aisle at Target and I've never been big into like vaginal wash but this one is non-irritating it smells good it doesn't irritate me I just said that non-irritating get it together Avery and also down there wipes and I actually really like it I feel like it smells good it makes me feel like more clean so I feel like that's a good one to check out no this is not sponsored by the way I just was buying tampons and was like "Hmm, let me try that so that's my advice also try not to wear really suffocating garments like don't wear I I will not lie I probably hardly ever wear underwear I feel like I wear underwear if I'm wearing jeans for obvious reasons I'm not trying to get chafed by a zipper on my pussy and and, um sometimes if I'm wearing like a short dress or something but don't wear super suffocating garments because it's going to irritate your badge so any who's us okay what's next let's see All right. This one said, need a whole episode on the boobs. I had a lift that now looks terrible four years later and I want implants. I'm so sorry about that, by the way. I, so honestly, I don't think I could do a whole episode about it, but I'll give you the full lowdown about what I did. You guys can skip past this if you heard this, because I've talked about this so much, but I did not get a boob job because I necessarily felt insecure about my boobs. I think it was just really hard for me to recognize my body after I breastfed. I, if you didn't know, I was naturally a 34 double D prior to having kids. So I had really big boobs. They sat decently high. They weren't super saggy. My sister and I are both very busty. And I breastfed Ziggy for about 10 months. And then I breastfed Stevie for 14 months. And when you already have, and this is like, conversations I had with my plastic surgeon she was kind of explaining this when you already have a full bust and you grow super big in pregnancy and then you make milks your boobs are even bigger my tits were literally like fucking boulders they were rock hard and I was really lucky where I did make a lot of milk so that was you know another thing that kind of affected that but then when they (laughs) basically suck the life out of you when you're breastfeeding so when I breastfed for so long they really just shrunk and lost a lot of volume in that tissue. And so I had a ton of loose extra skin. And all I wanted to do, I was really anti-lift. I did not want a boob lift. I thought it would give me horrible scars. And I was really against it because it wasn't necessarily the lifting of the boobs that bothered me, like the sagginess. It was the fact that the, what am I trying to say? The looseness of my skin was lacking that volume that I used to have. So I wanted an implant to kind of fill that extra loose skin. 
And my doctor, Dr. Khan, who's amazing, she's in Scottsdale, by the way. And yes, I paid in full. I don't like I did not get my boobs for free. People think that because I talk about her all the time, but I just honestly praise her work. So I think she did an incredible job. She was really open to the fact that I didn't want to lift. And she was like, look, I get that you don't want like a scar bigger than the little one that goes like under your boob for a typical implant. But she was like, because you had so much breast tissue in the past, your lift might sit a little bit higher and then you might have some excess breast tissue down below. So it's going to look kind of weird and lumpy. And she's like, I'm not guaranteeing that it's going to look like that. But she's like, I'm just being honest in a sense of, you know, we can always do an implant now and then you can come back later for a lift. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm doing this, I'm doing this once. I'm not going to want to come back and get it done again. And especially if she's going to, you know, put that little scar under my boobs and then have to add a lift scar later. I was like, fuck no, I do not want to do that. So I told her, I was like, okay, I'm open for a lift. And I thought originally I was going to have the anchor scar where it like cuts all the way under your boob and then the lollipop from the bottom of your nipple down. Because when you get a lift, they do have to remove your nipple and move it upwards to make sure your nipple's correctly placed. Because if they just lifted your boob and left your nipple, your nipple would literally be pointing at the ground. So that's what we did. The exact like implants that I got, I got silicone, 330ccs on both sides, which is can be kind of uncommon because boobs are like eyebrows. Their sister's not twins. So my left boob was bigger than my right because it produced more milk. So she ended up taking out some extra tissue on the left side to put the same size implants in both boobs. So that way they were perfectly even. I did high profile and we ended up doing a lift, obviously. So I'm really lucky where she only gave me the lollipop scar. I don't have any scarring underneath my boobs. So I don't have an anchor scar. And honestly, my scar looks incredible. I hardly did any scar treatment, by the way. If you watch on YouTube, I'll show you right now. I'm going to lift my tank up. Scott, my nipple's not showing right. And I'm like, for one, I literally just hit my one year post-op. That's a good fucking scar for one year. Like, I'm so happy with it. And I also love that it doesn't start right where my rib cage is. So like, if I show a little bit of under boob, you really can't see my scar. So happy with it. I technically still have a stitch around my areola, which you can't even see, huh, Scott? It's like white. Like, you literally can't see it. And the reason for that, which I didn't know actually until I got my boobs done, you can leave the stitch in indefinitely if you want to. They suggest not taking it out for, I believe she said around 18 months or later, because if you take it out prior to that, your areola can expand. And I'm like, I'm not trying to have an areola the size of my face, okay? So maybe we'll leave it indefinitely. Maybe we'll take it out soon. I don't know. But honestly, I am so happy that I like made the jump and got my boobs done. I was always so anti-boob job and I'll be very honest about that. I feel like prior to having kids though, I was very lucky. We're like, in the past, I didn't think I was lucky. In fifth grade, I was so insecure. I'd wear like five sports bras because the boys would make fun of me and say I walked like a duck waddling, like with my chest out and my butt out because I had a huge butt and big boobs at 10 years old. And when it wasn't the way I was walking, that was just, I looked different, a different, more womanly body than most kids in elementary school. So I would pile on all of these sports bras and those like camis with built-in bras. So I looked more flat chested, which is so sad, but I just look different, you know? And so I always hated my boobs. And then as I became a woman, obviously I was like slig on natural tits. And I was like, I just don't get like people getting boobs. They're so plastic and like don't move. Bitch, the fuck are you talking about? Wait till you breastfeed and your nipples are touching your knees. Okay. I had no idea what the fuck I was talking about. Tits are the best thing I've ever bought. And I'm so happy I bought them. And you know what? I was also really worried because I'm not the type of girl that wanted her tits like up here. I did not want boobs at my collarbone. And I'm so happy with how they settled with the lift. They look so natural. And the biggest compliment I ever get is, are your boobs real? I'm like, slay. No, they're not. But the fact that you asked me that shows me that they look natural. So I'm so happy I got them. Oh, people will ask too. I paid 
um, $14,440. So it was around $9,000 for the lift and around $5,000 for the implants for people that are wondering. So I was quoted by some other surgeons in the Scottsdale area for like between $20 and $25K. And I literally paid less than fifteen, dollars and I feel like my boobs are some of the best I've ever seen. So I'm just saying, it doesn't matter about the price tag. I know a lot of people are like, I'm going to go to Beverly Hills to get my boobs done. I'm like, you're literally going to pay $30,000 for something you could get done for half the cost that could even look better. So just like keep in mind if you guys are going to get plastic surgery, which I'm a big advocate for, by the way, make sure that you do your research on the surgeon and who you're going to, what their work is, and not just on their website. Talk to people in your actual personal life of their experience because obviously they're going to put the best photos on their social media and their website because I've seen a lot of people go to very well-known plastic surgeons and are so unhappy with their results. So just keep that in mind. But for anyone considering getting their boobs done, go you, get the tits. You'll be obsessed with yourself. It literally kills me when creepy men leave these questions. Do you do butt stuff? Do you go down on your girl? Probably not. (laughs) And that's on period. (laughs) Do you think it matters how many people your partner has slept with? So I actually love this topic because first of all, my answer is no. I don't feel like it matters. I feel like as you establish a relationship and they put you first. Their past doesn't matter when it comes to that. I think it's a very controversial thing with couples, especially when they first meet, is like asking their body count, which I think is super unhealthy. And I'll tell you why. And I am speaking from a place of like 10 years ago. That was me with David. I was like, how many girls? What did they look like? What positions did you do? Um, Did you use a condom? I was psychotic. And like, what the fuck do I need to know that? Also, why the fuck am I torturing myself to know that? Like I'm literally asking to like make myself miserable. And he had a way higher body. When I say way higher, it was like less than 10 people, by the way. But he had a much higher body count than I did because I met him when I was 18 years old. I had one boyfriend prior to David. So I think it was just very much insecure immaturity. But I think knowing that will skew your mind a little bit and like trigger a lot of jealousy and issues. I just don't think it's necessary to talk about. I think it's necessary to talk about exes if maybe they're still involved in your life, if there's, you know, trauma that that they're dealing with that the other person can kind of help them through and that's for either party. But I think obsessing over the body count shouldn't matter because A, they're more experienced. A, you got the good stuff, okay? And then B, if they're ending up with you, why does it matter, right? You might not be their first, but you could be their last baby. Listen, Scott is in his hoe era, but I know for a fucking fact, he'll literally be the best husband and dad there ever was. And once he commits to someone, that'll be it for life. So it's like, who cares how many dicks he sucked? Like, he'll suck one for the rest of his life, but the other ones don't count, which means his husband's going to have like the most experienced man in bed. Slay on Scott's future husband, which by the way, have we found one yet? Okay. All right. Let's hurry it up because I'm trying to be the mater of honor. Mater of honor. All right. This person asked, why so much diarrhea? Why did you ask that? That's my question back. I literally talked twice this week about having liquid lava coming out of my asshole because I'm a human being and I like spicy ramen. Okay. And then the other time was Scott made me order really late at night a spicy chicken sandwich from McDonald's and it was probably full of food poisoning or some shit. So it's called a natural cleanse and I don't want to hear shit about it, okay? It's so- I'm sorry, this is a saucy episode and you're asking me why I have IBS? I don't know. That's how God made me. <laughs> I love this question. Not trying to ask in a rude way, but does your husband get mad for posting fire emojis? pics basically meaning like sexy pics no because he's behind the camera see that's the thing is that he is taking those for me and I just really don't get this like I'm sorry I will say point blank period if your significant other calls you out for posting sexy photos on social media they're so insecure they're insecure in themselves and your relationship 
I don't think that's healthy. I've had friends in the past where they basically get stopped by their significant other before leaving the house saying that they need to change their clothes because their dress is too short. That is so insecure for me. When you've been together and you have a secure relationship, that should never occur, ever. And the fact that, and I, you guys know I'm pro gay, straight, bi, trans, but in my opinion, in a male-female relationship, if a man is mad that you are showing your body, but they are shirtless on the beach, they are working out at the gym with a tank top on, they're posting selfies, flexing their muscles or their abs or whatever, I'm sorry, bitch, you're showing your nipples. Why can't I pose my body in a bikini? If anything, your mindset should change and be like, yeah, she's fire and she's mine. Or yeah, he's fire and he's mine. Like that is all that matters. I think my, I'm so obsessed with my husband. No one could ever change my mind. Like if you are happy and you love that person, that's all that matters. And my husband knows I'm not going anywhere. So it's like he admires that taking the photo and seeing it posted. And he loves that people give it attention because he's like, you're my wife and I'm so proud of you. Especially after having two kids, he's like, you look incredible. You're beautiful. You give us these amazing babies. That is what matters. And I feel like your partner's job, like your life partner's job or the person that you're with should be your number one support system. I am so grateful to have millions of people that follow me and love me and support me But my husband matters more. And the fact that he tells me I'm beautiful and he takes the photo and likes them, that matters way more to me because I know he's my number one fan. And that's, oh shit, not me spilling my tumbler water. And that's all that matters. So I feel like if you're going through that, you need to straight up call him out. Like I just, you need to feel like your hottest, most authentic fire self. And if the person you're with doesn't support you, then bye-bye, move on. All right, here's a great saucy one. I can't orgasm with my husband, but no problem by myself. Help me. Totally get it. Having an orgasm, you have to be so relaxed and comfortable, which is hard with your partner. Like Dave and I have been there for 10 years and there's still times in the bedroom where I feel like, oh, I'm insecure. I'm embarrassed. I'm shy, whatever. So first of all, I feel like establishing that comfortability is big, which I know takes a long time and I'm still going through that after a decade. I feel like introducing toys helps a lot. A lot of men are anti-vibrators, which, okay, we that's a whole other subject I could bitch about. But when you incorporate a vibrator with your husband, I feel like it does help you relax a lot more. And you just have to think in your head, me being pleasured and showing him that I'm pleasured is going to be the biggest turn on for him. Like, I'm going to get really saucy for a second, but I feel like nothing turns my husband on more than when he knows I'm about to get off because he's like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And I happily have a vibrator right on my clit and I don't care. And he doesn't either because he's got the dig in me too. Like it it really doesn't matter if you need a little bit of help, which by the way, do you guys know only 30% of women can actually have an orgasm only from vaginal penetration? So I guarantee men that think they're making girls come, probably 50% of them are not actually having an orgasm. They're probably faking it, unfortunately. So that's why I think men need to understand or whoever you're with needs to understand, if you need a little bit of help, that's natural. That is anatomical. Like women just, a lot of women just physically cannot get off without a little bit of help. And that could be their fingers or your fingers or a vibrator, whatever the case may be. But I'm telling you, it will change the game for you. If you've tried that and you still can't, I do feel like This is probably bad to say, but I do feel like a glass of wine does help. And I'm not saying like every time you have sex, you need to get drunk. That's really bad like to compare it to. But I'm just saying sometimes it does kind of take the edge off. We're able to relax a little bit. And then once you kind of like rip the bandaid off and break that boundary, I feel like it gets easier and easier. Like, for example, I've had friends that are like, I'm too embarrassed to go on top because they're looking at me and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Totally get it. But I feel like once you rip the bandaid off and you do it once, you'll be like, oh, that was actually really fun. Or I kind of like that. And a lot of women 
get off easier on top because, you know, the D's in the right spot. So they're, they kind of like, you know, discover things and try things. I also think just communicating with whoever you're with, your partner, I think you said your husband, but just telling them like, you know, I haven't been able to have an orgasm and I really want to, and I want to work on it together. You know, can we experiment and try X, Y, and Z? And I know that's a awkward conversation. I get it, even with your husband, but I do feel like if you have a really good supporting, supportive husband, they will want to get you there and they will want to work with you and be like, of course, like what turns you on? Or like, cause you said you can by, by yourself. So it's like, okay, when you're masturbating, what, what gets you to that point? Cause if you kind of incorporate that with your husband and you mesh it together, I feel like you'd be set girl. All right. This person said, okay, for real, how do you stay spicy with kids in the house? I'm loud. Laugh my ass off. Slay bitch. I love to be loud too. You know what? It's the white noise machine. Uh, I've had people tell me that the upstairs of my house sounds like a mix between like a tornado and a hurricane. Actually, fun fact. So our bedroom is across the hallway from Stevie and Ziggy's bedroom. The girls are on the other side completely of the house, which was kind of purposeful, by the way, because they're teenagers and they're up late. But each kid has a white noise hatch machine so stevie's is playing on full blast ziggy's is playing on full blast and then we'll put ours on and obviously all the doors are closed same like when kids are little too at least with my kids once they're out they are out like with their white noise we just wait for them to fall asleep ziggy would probably come in thinking like i was dying or something but yeah i mean sometimes you just you just got to let it out. And I feel like the white noise does help. So I just feel like you have to kind of drown it out, whether that's with the TV or white noise, whatever the case may be. There was tons of questions about my nipple piercings, which I love to talk about. Um, sorry, I did not mean to flip off the camera on my YouTube. I'm like, hey, fuck you guys. <laughs> love you. Kidding. Uh, when you had your nipples pierced for the first time, did they allow more sensation? You know, I'm trying to think back because this was so long ago. I don't... Yeah, I would say it did bring more sensation. It was kind of like a different way, but I feel like more so in general, it just turned me on more knowing that they were pierced. Like, I don't know. I just thought it was so fun. It just, nipple piercings just really make you feel so sexy. Like I have so many friends, I've either convinced to get them pierced and their lives have been changed or they really want to do it. My thing about a nipple piercing is I didn't do it for anyone but myself and as you guys know, I've talked about in the past, I had it way before kids and then I took them out to breastfeed. And then once I got my boobs redone, I'm sorry, not redone. Once I got my boob job, I got my nipple piercings redone because they had closed after I breastfed. And I just think it's a piercing for you. Like no one has to see it. No one has to know. It's under your clothes. You don't show it. Like I'm not showing nipples on social media. It's for me and me only. And I think it is a cute little accessory, like when David sees me naked and stuff. But I just think it's so fun. It's empowering. It's different. And I do, I will say, like, you guys know I love a little slutty outfit, but I do love in like a cute little top or a bikini. You can see like a little bit of the nipple ring. Cute, cute. I love it. If you're considering getting your nipples pierced, please do it. The pain is really not that bad. There's so much cute jewelry. And like I said, do it for you. Like, no one else matters. It's your body. Oh my God. This is actually so funny because I was just talking to one of my best friends about this, how to talk dirty as a woman. So listen, I'm not going to go through and tell you all the nasty shit I tell my husband in the bedroom, okay? But I'll honestly, because I have friends, not me being like the slutty friend, everyone's like, Avery, how do I talk dirty to my husband in bed? And I'm like, all right, everyone sit down in a circle. Let's discuss. <laughs> Scott's laughing because he knows it's true. So I I'm a big advocate of just saying how you feel in the moment. And it took me years with David to talk like any sort of dirty. And I feel like if I'm like a little bit buzzed, obviously it's crazier than when I'm sober or something. But I just feel like it kind of like fills the void of quiet, like in between moaning, I guess. I don't know. But I think in the moment... <laughs> I, I don't want to give example. Should I give example, Scott? I'm embarrassed. Like, <laughs> me and my friend were like, a classic one. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. What was the other one? Oh, is it? 
His entire <laughs> scotch. Shut the fuck up, Scott. What was the other one? Or, oh, you made me so wet. <laughs> God, I'm gonna get banned off all my platforms. What was the other one that I was like, oh, that's a really good one? Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What was it? Oh, you're so big. Like, <laughs> shut the fuck up, Scott. <laughs> okay, okay, get it together, Avery. Here's the thing I feel like you have to kind of mix between hyping your partner up. And also encouraging yourself of like, I don't know. I feel like you can dirty talk but not in a demeaning way because there's like some phrases that I've heard before and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I can say that. It's kind of like degrading to myself. But I feel like there are, <laughs> there are good ways to go about it. And honestly, if you did that to your partner, no matter who they are, they're going to be like, oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. That's so Jenna Marbles coded. Oh, hell yeah. If anyone know who Jenna Marbles is, she's the OG queen of YouTube and she needs to come back. I don't know how I got from sexual dirty talk to Jenna Marbles, but we out here. <laughs> Blowjob tips. <laughs> Scott, you want to take over? Use your hands. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, my yeah, I agree with Scott. So, a lot of people that I've talked to have issues with their gag reflex. So, hands help. Whether it's a single or double, then you don't have to put the whole thing in your mouth. Slay. You want to twist? Oh, I'm getting so graphic today. Wow, we're just really in a mood. It's so early in the morning and I'm just really just talking about vile shit. God. So I feel like when you kind of like do it, I'm not going to do it on YouTube and get banned off here, but if you do it in like a twisty motion and also people will ask me questions about swallowing, spitting, all that, you always want to swallow and do it under your tongue when it's the time. Put the, put your tongue <laughs> over the tip and then it's not just squirting straight in the back of your throat. It makes it so much easier. Also... Cover your teeth with your lips like this. Yeah, that helps. And use a lot of spit. And Scott, anything else? Yeah, I feel like that's... I feel like you're definitely the expert, but that helps. Okay, yeah, because I'm fucking old. Thanks. He's like, you're way... You've been doing it a lot longer. Well, listen. All right, how do you stay emotionally and physically connected? I'm getting bored in my marriage. All right. I feel like, first of all, this is very natural If to make you feel better. I feel like when you've been with the same person for a long time, every stage comes with ebbs and flows, right? And there's difficult times, there's boring times, there's exciting times, there's stressful times. That just comes with a relationship and it's very normal. So I don't want you to think it's abnormal or something's wrong. I think staying connected with communication is huge. Like I'm a big advocate for consistent date nights and in-home date nights if you're not able to financially go out every week or get a babysitter. I'm not sure if you have kids or anything, but I feel like just taking the time to prioritize you guys together and spending that quality time together is huge because you came first, right? And there was a time where you were obsessed with this person. You fell in love with this person. You decided to spend the rest of your life with this person. So you obviously have something. And I feel like marriage is all about growing together rather than growing apart. And again, I've said this in the past, but I do feel like in a marriage, it's so important to work on yourself as individuals, but still make sure you're growing together in your marriage as you're evolving as a human being. Like meeting David at 18 years old, he's been with me my entire adult life. So of course I've evolved and changed so much as a person, but I've always made sure that he is my stagnant, he's my priority, and he has been the one to stay with me for so long. I feel like even just talking to them about it of saying, you know, I feel like we're kind of missing our spice and our spark that we used to have. And I miss that because I bet that person, like, I bet your partner probably feels it too. And maybe you can have a conversation of like, I would love to prioritize and get back to where we were during this time. What were we doing different? You know, 
what do you miss? What do I miss? And not turn it into a fight or getting offend- offended, you know, or becoming offensive to your partner, but kind of figuring out what's missing and going back to how you were in the past and what made you guys fall in love. That kind of goes back to the root of your relationship. And I feel like you can kind of spark and grow from there. This kind of made me laugh. What's the sex life like with an age gap? Well, we're not 30 years apart. We're six years apart. So it's fire, honestly. Being with a little bit of an older, mature man, fire. Highly recommend. I love this question. I want to start dressing to show off my girls. And she put some melon emojis for her boobies. How to not feel judged slash awkward. You know, do you know what makes me laugh? Is I literally was just talking to Scott that M had texted me from a video we had posted on my boat. And she had like more of a tankini bikini on and I had like a bikini and someone commented basically slut shaming me saying I was showing too much skin. Why the fuck do you care? What? I'm sorry. Why? Why are we still in this era of judging women for what they put on their bodies? It really sickens me and it sickens me for my daughter. Like I hope as she grows up, she doesn't feel that way. I'm sorry, just because someone's showing off their body doesn't make them a slut, doesn't make them a whore, doesn't mean they're a bad human being, doesn't mean they don't believe in God or they're not going to go to heaven. That kind of shit pisses me off. The way I dress does not reflect the type of human being that I am. Never has, never will. I don't care if I'm fucking walking around with nipple pasties on. I still know I'm a good person and a good wife and a good mom and a loyal person to my family and my friends. That's all that matters. What I wear is not a reflection of that. And if you don't agree with me wearing that type of stuff, that's okay because you can dress however you want. That's what I keep in my mind. If people want to judge you, that is a hundred percent a reflection on them because I feel like nine times out of 10, if I'm being judged either from people directly saying it to me or from looks, I can tell it's because they're insecure. You should be proud of your body. You probably have beautiful boobs. Bless you, Scott. (laughs) And show them off. Like, you know, 20 years down the road when your body's not looking the same, you're gonna be like, damn, I should have shown off the titties. Like, I will always be an advocate for that because I will only be young and hot once. Might as well show it off. You think I paid for these tits for nothing? No, I will let everyone know that I have giant fake boobs. Thank you very much. I just, I don't get the stigma around that. And it it makes me so irritated. But again, I'm like, but you want to wear that, right? Or you would wear that. That's why you're judging me. And you want to make it about my personality or thinking I'm a bad human being. And it has nothing to do with that. You just are judging me based off what I wear. What the fuck is that about? That's crazy to me. So I think if you feel good in it, you feel hot in it, you think your tits look amazing, you should wear it. 100%. Show off your body, girl. You're beautiful. Makes you feel good. That's all that matters. Everyone else can suck it. Someone said, film this episode with David. So unfortunately, he would never. He is so shy. He would never, ever sit down in a podcast and talk about this. Uh, It's actually his worst nightmare. So maybe in the future or if he's really drunk. But tips on postpartum sex for the first time. Great question. It's not super fun. I'll be honest about that. Takes a couple tries. And let's not be having sex like three days postpartum, okay? You're setting yourself up for failure. It's going to hurt like a bitch. I did not have vaginal birth, so I'm going to explain my experience via C-section. I think we waited – I think – oh, I think you're supposed to wait eight weeks, and I think we waited six. Sorry. But my biggest thing that was hard was he couldn't, like, lay on me because obviously my incision. And the second thing was the amount of pressure in my incision – It just felt like I was going to get ripped open. So that was really fun. But there's other things you can do to kind of warm yourself up to it. I think it's just about making sure your partner is being gentle and communicating with you. That's the biggest thing. Like, I'm sorry. I know you've waited, but like, let's not rail into me after I just birthed your child. That's absolutely unnecessary. So I think it's just like taking it slow, communicating, telling them that is really painful or maybe changing positions to make sure that you're comfy. 
also i know with your body it's going to be really weird like i was literally leaking milk all over him it was so sticky and i felt disgusting but i think just kind of like setting yourself up for success right like putting a nursing bra on with some pads because when you have sex you will leak milk everywhere just fyi for those i don't know and you know if you want the lights off because you just had a baby so your body's really different that's okay that is absolutely okay And respectfully, all that matters in the moment is you. You just had a baby. You just gave birth. And I understand you miss being intimate with your partner, but just make sure that you're letting them know like, you know, that's painful or okay, that's, that feels good. Or, you know, I want to wear this because it makes me feel more comfortable in my own skin. There should be no like argument at all. It should be point blank period. Okay, babe, no problem, whatever you need. So I think just that type of healthy communication is key for postpartum sex. What what should I do if the D doesn't fit? Honestly, be proud. (laughs) Good for both of you. Honestly. (laughs) All right. This isn't really saucy. It's just kind of like personal. How is co-parenting with the older girl's mom going? I feel like that's rarely talked about. So unfortunately, you're wrong because it's talked about a lot. (laughs) I've talked about this on multiple of my episodes. I don't feel like it's worth getting super detailed on because there's an entire other parent involved that's very private, not on social media, doesn't need or want unwanted attention from my career, and I don't blame her for that. I also think our girls are teenagers and they have iPhones and access to social media and they're in junior high and there's a lot of kids at their school that follow them. So me talking about such a, you know, intimate, serious subject that's very personal to our family does not need to be be all over the internet. Like I've said in the past, we've been co-parenting for 10 years. So we have done what works for us. I don't need to talk about custody arrangements or where they live or, you know, what future plans are. And when people have unwanted comments to say about it, you're judging off of very little knowledge and what you know. So I think just know that everything's cordial and fine and there's no drama and there doesn't need to be any drama. And we've worked through a lot of things that I think we should all be very proud of. And all that matters is that we put the girls first and we keep that relationship very private because when the girls are old enough and they, if they want to, you know, be more involved in my social media and, and I don't know, maybe show more of their lives and that's fine as, you know, time goes on. But right now that's something that's sacred to us and something I don't need, think needs to be exposed because so much comes with that, if that makes sense. My fiance is so fucking hot, but sometimes I'm just not in the mood. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Nothing is wrong with you. I feel like hormones just makes your sex drive come in ebbs and flows, right? Like I feel like one week I want to have sex five times and one week I'm like, don't touch me for five days. It just depends on, first of all, your emotional connection, obviously like them being hot and you're attracted to them. That's incredible and amazing. Slay. But like if you're not emotionally on the same level as them, for me at least, I don't want to be intimate with you. So I feel like it's a lot of factors that kind of play into it, but there's nothing wrong with it. I do feel like certain things affect your sex drive. Like if you feel consistently like your libido is down, go talk to your OB. Birth control can affect that. Anti-anxiety and depression meds can affect that. Lots of things can go into that. High stress during your work or life or financial stress, that all affects your sex life. It all comes into play, which is like, God, Mother Nature, give me some sort of fucking break. Can I just be horny all the time? But I think if it's consistent, talk to your doctor. If it's not, just know it's normal and that's okay. I always have the rule of thumb where it's like, I don't really want to have sex, but like, you know, they want to have sex. I feel like you never regret it. You know what I mean? Like if you're not in the mood, don't push it. But I do feel like once I get started, I'm like, okay, I'm glad that we did this. You know what I'm saying? Okay, guys, this concludes our little saucy episode. Thanks for joining me today. I had so much fun. I feel like I'm in a mood now to go fuck shit up or something. I don't know. Put the kids down later and just jump David's bones. (laughs) I love you guys so much. I will see you next Monday. Cheers.